in case there are any issues with the internet, that it'll uh, be recorded for you guys. Okay. Um, so this week, let's uh, let's go ahead and switch screens here. And let me pull up the chat so that I can see you guys see if you have any questions. There we go. OK. Um, so if we scroll down to the very end here, uh, week, week 13 was the week before Thanksgiving. Week 14 was Thanksgiving week. So that Tuesday, we had the exam. This week is week 15. Uh, so as you can see here on Web Campus, I have um, created a page for it where I'm going to upload the lecture notes and the video for today, as well as the study guide for the final. And here is the recipe that's used on the study guide. Um, so if you, if you click on the page, uh, this will open up the, as soon as this loads, just the page that I created um, that has a link to the to both the study guide and the recipe. And then below here, as soon as um, today is over and the video is uploaded, I'll, I'll post the link to the video and the notes for today and also for uh, next time as well. So that's, that's what we have going on there. And so we'll be going through the review uh, the study guide for the final today and next class. And then the week after that is the final exam. So uh, that's where you can find the study guide. I would uh, recommend uh, downloading this or at least at the very least, you know, logging in and following through uh, as, as we go through. Um, but definitely if you want, you can download it or print it. Uh, so this is the, the review that we're going through. And then um, on problem, let's see which problem is it here. I think it's problem four, problem five. Problem five, it, it uh, mentions a recipe used in one of the mini projects. Um, and since the mini projects went online, uh, I had to grab the recipe and uh, upload that. So that is that is this recipe that is uh, here as well, this recipe file. So as soon as this loads, let's take a look. So here's the recipe that we're going to be using for problem five. Uh, and this, this uh, I basically just copied from, from, that, uh, from that mini project from before it went online. Um, Okay, so let's go to the study guide then. Uh, before we jump into the study guide, uh, are there any, any questions? Any questions, comments, any of the previous material, any of the homework? And you can either use the audio if you want, uh, or you can type in chat. I'll, I'll Keep my eye on chat in case there are any questions. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions, so we'll go ahead and jump into the review. So the final the final exam is cumulative. Oh, I did have a question. Um so There were a few issues with uh, with the Pearson that I wasn't anticipating. Um, when I was uh, reviewing the problems that were on it, I noticed that I couldn't uh, upload the images for the for the formulas, so I had to uh, send out that as as a second secondary sheet. Um, I'm thinking. I might possibly, it might be easier to use uh, Web Campus for the final exam instead of Pearson, because Pearson was, uh, it had some issues that I wasn't expecting. How would you guys feel about about that if, if we did the uh, the final exam on, on uh, Web Campus instead of Pearson?
Or would you guys prefer Pearson or? Oh, Web, Web Campus, okay. One vote for Web Campus. So I think I might do that because with Web Campus, I know that I can uh, upload the images and it's a little bit easier, a little bit more accessible. So I think I think we'll do that for the final exam. Okay, um, and I'll send out that. Uh, I'll, I'll email you guys probably either tomorrow or Thursday with that information. Okay, all right. Um, so let's go ahead and, and jump to the final. So the final is cumulative, which means anything that we've talked about uh, in class uh, can potentially show up on the final exam. So um, obviously there are uh, there are two things that I would focus on uh, when you're studying for this. The first is the final exam study guide here, um, which has which I posted to Web Campus this morning, uh, and the second thing is to uh, look at the um, the practice final on Pearson. So even though we won't use Pearson, I, I will still um, upload a, a practice exam, a practice final exam for that, um, so that you guys can can use that as a as a study guide. Um, the other the other things, if you have if you have time and you want extra study, uh, it would be a good idea to go through the previous exams, so exam one, exam two, exam three, um, and make sure that you know how to do uh, any of the problems on on those exams. Okay, um, so it is cumulative. So anything that we've talked about in the course, um, but again, the the uh, the questions, particularly here on on this study guide, and on the the uh, final uh, final exam practice tests on Pearson, are good problems to focus on. Uh, so uh, this one, um, this study a study guide, I believe it has 20 questions, so we'll go through. I'm just gonna start at the at the top and we'll work our way down and uh, hopefully we'll get through um, through all the questions by next class. And uh, we'll continue on with that. So let's start with problem one. So problem one, and again, uh, just like the previous ones, uh, at the beginning here, it tells you what uh, what section it's from. This is from section 1A. Oh, that's a good question. How many questions are on the final? Um, let's see, the final exam, for the, for the in-class exams, you have 75 minutes. For the final exam, you have 120 minutes. You have the two hours instead of the hour and 15. Um, so it'll be it'll be similar to the uh, test one, test two, test three, but it's going to have maybe uh, five to ten more problems on it because uh, you'll have uh, forty-five more minutes. So it'll have it'll be a, about the same as the previous exam, possibly with uh, five to ten more questions. Probably with five to ten more questions. Um, all right, so this one is from section 1A, which was on uh, logic. Here we're looking at uh, fallacies. And so what we want to do is we want to identify the premise and the conclusion or premises. Remember, there can be more than one premise when we're looking at an argument. Um, describe how the fallacy occurs and possibly make up another argument that exhibits the same fallacy. Uh, so let's, let me switch here. Hold on one second. Switch to the digital paper. And I think I can hide. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me let let me adjust this to where it needs to be. All right. I believe that's about the size that'll let me type hopefully to the end of the page. Uh, Settings here. Let me try and there we go. All right. Oh, 
OK, so uh, just as a reminder, with, with the fallacies, um, this one, there were 10, 10 fallacies that we were focusing on in, in this, this class. There are more, more than that. There, there are a, a lot of different fallacies, but we were focusing on 10. So we have 10. OK, Let's see if that works. 10 common fallacies. And so uh, we remind ourselves of what those are. Hmm. First one that we talked about was appeal to popularity. Uh, second was false cause. Third was appeal to ignorance. Fourth was hasty generalization. The fifth one we talked about was appeal, no, was limited choice, sorry. Limited choice. Uh, sixth, appeal to emotion. Seven was personal attack. Eight is circular reasoning. Nine, diversion. And 10, straw man. Those were the 10 fallacies that we talked about in class. I believe on the first exam, what we had was a, a match the fallacy with, with the argument that's given. So there were about, if I remember right, five arguments that were given and we had to match that with the fallacy. And it might be that again, or it might be uh, this, this question. Uh, now this question, unfortunately, I keep forgetting to switch out this uh, argument. This is not the argument I want to use. This one is kind of ambiguous. So I want to look at a problem in the book. Let's look at, uh, look at problem 12 in the book on page 12. I'm sorry, let me and I have to move the windows here when I'm streaming. So I can just change that to about that size. OK. Uh, now, so in the textbook on page 12, uh, problems 11 through 20 are good questions to look at to uh, review the fallacies. So if, um, Right, this is section 1A, so you just go to the, uh, to the exercises at the end of section 1A here. On page 12, uh, this is where it begins, problems 11 through 20, which is on 12 and 13, go through different arguments. Uh, I believe it's one example for each of the 10 fallacies. Uh, the one I wanted to look at was number 12. So let me type that first, and then we'll go through identify what is the premise or premises, what is the conclusion, and we'll look at what type of fallacy is given. So uh, this one, I became sick just hours after eating a burger, uh, sorry, eating at Burger Hut. So its food must have made me sick. That is the argument. OK. So first, uh, let's identify number one. OK. Sorry, hold on one second. I need to. That is not letting me write. OK. All right. 
Now I remember why I don't use the uh, typing. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. All right. Uh, number one. Uh, so first thing we want to look at, uh, what is the premise or premises? And we want to also know uh, what is the conclusion. Uh, for me, I like to look at what is the conclusion first. That's just my personal preference uh, because the conclusion is what you are arguing uh, is, is basically what your argument is. Uh, what, what is. What is the thing you're trying to convince someone else of? Uh, and then the premise or the premises, uh, and you can have more than one premise, uh, is what you're using as evidence. So first, uh, what is what is the conclusion? Let's start with that one. What is the conclusion for this argument? And again, the argument is I became sick hours after eating at Burger Hut, so its food must have made me sick. But what is the conclusion? And you can use either again the uh, you can type that in chat or you can use the audio. I am uh, keeping my eye on chat, so I know there's a little bit of a delay, so there might be. A little bit of time before you hear the question and type it in. Uh, but what is the conclusion for this argument? The conclusion would be that the food from Burger Hut made the person sick. That is correct. Yes, excellent. The conclusion is that the food from Burger Hut made the person sick. So this is that the uh, food made me sick. Uh huh. And it's not letting me write further than that. Sorry. Okay. And then what is the premise or premises then? And so what we're using as evidence is I became sick just hours after eating that food. That's that's the premise. Became sick hours after eating. OK. Now, in this particular example, we just have one premise. But as a reminder, we can have multiple premises. We can have um, Technically, there's no limit on the number of premises we can have. Uh, but there should only be one conclusion. OK. So we've identified the premise and the conclusion. Next, what fallacy has, uh, has happened here? So what is the fallacy? So let's go back to our list. And, and again, uh, just, like, just like any of the previous exams, and anything that was uh, provided for those will be provided for the final. Uh, anything that um, you needed to memorize for those exams, you'll need to have memorized for the final. So it's not like you have to. Um, remem uh, memorize each one of these in detail. You just have to remember which one goes with which. So in this case, uh, what is the fallacy that has occurred? Well, our evidence is that we became sick hours after eating. That's our premise. Sorry, our conclusion is the food made me sick. So in this case, it's not going to be a pill to popularity. I guess we could mark some of these off. It's not going to be a pill to popularity. It's not going to be a pill to ignorance uh, or emotion, personal attack, particular reasoning, diversion, or straw man. Um, 
So in this case, it looks like it's going to be false cause. We're using the evidence that we ate there just hours before we became sick as evidence that the food is what made what made us sick. And so that is a false cause. It may not have been caused by the food. So this is false cause. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, and then the uh, last part of this, and you still might be typing, which is fine. If I, when I see the, the question, I'll answer it. Um, so the last part of this question for problem one is uh, make up an argument that exhibits the same fallacy. So um, let's think of an example, if you guys can. Let's think of an example uh, of a false cause argument. Does anyone have any that they would like to share? In class, we had an example where it was like every time a person washed their car, it rained the next day. Would that be a good example in this case? Uh, yes. Exactly. That would be a that would be a very good example in this case. Yeah, that would that's good. So let's remind ourselves of that example. The example that we um, had was uh, every time I wash my car, it rains the next day. Uh, today I wash my car, so it will rain tomorrow. And that is a false cause uh, argument. So that that would actually be uh, very good as an example. Yeah, good. Uh, any other examples anyone wants to share? If not, that's fine, but. Okay. All right, so let's move on then. So that was this first question. Um, identify the premise or premises and conclusion. What fallacy has occurred? In this case, it was false. Oh, the example that I gave was false cause and then give another argument that exhibits that same fallacy. And you're more than welcome to use any of the fallacies that we uh, had as examples in class, yeah. Uh, number two, we're looking at uh, Venn diagrams to analyze relationships, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, so this one, this one we've seen before. So uh, this one, uh, we want to construct a Venn diagram uh, and then answer questions about the relationship. So we're actually, we're going to add in um, one extra step in between here, which is making the two-way table. Um, so let's go ahead and read the problem, then we'll make the, the two-way table. Uh, from that, we'll make the Venn diagram, and then we'll uh, answer the question or questions. I think this one only has one question uh, concerning the, the trial. Okay, so here we have a trial of a new vaccine. 100 people were given the vaccine and 50 were given a placebo. Of those given the medicine, 80 never developed symptoms. And of those given the placebo, 10 never developed symptoms. Uh, so that's, that's what we're given. We wanna make a Venn diagram. And uh, the question that we are asked is how many people who received the vaccine did not improve? Okay, so let's go to our digital paper here and we're going to make a two-way table. So this one is number question two on the review. And so we're going to do a, a two-way table first. And so in reading through this, this, uh, this question, notice there's, there are two variables that we are dealing with. There, there are two questions essentially that we're as that we're. Um, if you want to think of this as a survey that was given to these individuals, there would be two questions on the survey. First question was, um, were you given the vaccine or the placebo? So that is our first variable. So we have our first variable. 
is, did we get the vaccine or the placebo? And then the second thing, when we're reading through this, second thing we are uh, given is 80 never developed symptoms. That would be the second variable, the second question that we would be asked is, did you develop symptoms? Or the only other possibility with that, uh, did you not develop symptoms? So uh, symptoms or no symptoms. Okay. Oh, I have a question here. The Oh, the cookie recipe, uh, that's going to be question five on the review. So uh, yeah, so we'll be using that for question five, sorry. Uh, I, I don't remember if I mentioned that, but I'll mention it now. Yeah, so the cookie recipe, that's for problem five in the, on the review, on the study guide. Yep. <laughs> so it's not, yeah, that's, that's why it's up there. OK. Um, so let's go with our 2A table. Oh, no, yeah, no, um, <laughs> no, no worries about that. That's actually, maybe I should do something like that for the Christmas holiday, but I'm not that inventive. Uh, well, for one, I'm not a, a good cook, so I don't know what a good recipe is. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at our 2A table. So uh, for the row, we would have our, one of our variables. We'll just pick the first variable. So we have the uh, vaccine. Oh, I need to adjust that. Uh, or the placebo. And if you remember, um, in class, I also said I wanted to add a, a third uh, part, which is total. And uh, Now, the book doesn't add total, but I think it helps in just keeping everything organized. Uh, the second variable are going to be the, is the column. So we have uh, symptoms no symptoms, and again, total. So uh, this is our two-way table. Again, it's two-way because we have two variables that we are considering here. That's why they call it the two-way table. Um, sorry, let me... So let's fill out the table using the information that we are given. Now, uh, in general, for these problems, you won't be given all of the information from the table, but you'll be given enough that you can fill it out uh, in its entirety. Uh, so reading through here, 100 people were given the vaccine. So uh, under the total for vaccine, we have 100 individuals. Uh, the next question, 50 were given the placebo. So we have 50 here for the placebo. And so the total number of individuals that were given, uh, that were in this study were 150 people, 150 individuals. Um, so the total number is 150. So we get that from the first sentence. Second sentence. Of those given the medicine, that should say vaccine. Let me make note of that for when I edit this. Uh, of the vaccine, 80 never developed symptoms. So here, 80 never, never developed symptoms. And of those given the placebo, 10 never developed symptoms. So 10 never developed symptoms on the placebo. Uh, and that is all the information that we are given. So that is what we have so far. So let's fill out the rest of the table. So. Um, and I guess it really doesn't matter where you start. Uh, you could start with the first box, or you could look at the totals. Let's start with the first box. So um, how many on the vaccine uh, developed symptoms? Well, if 100 were given the vaccine and 80 never had symptoms, then how many developed symptoms on the vaccine? 20. 20, exactly right. Okay, 
Uh, next one. For, so for the placebo, 50 were given the placebo, 10 never developed symptoms. So 40 individuals had symptoms while on the placebo. Okay, so the total number of individuals that developed symptoms, there is 60. Total with no symptoms is 90. And when we add those together, we should get the total uh, in the study. So 60 plus 90, 150, that does match. So we are, we are good to go. So that is our two-way table. So remember the two-way table is called two-way because you have two variables, that's two questions. If you wanna think of it that way, two questions that are asked on the survey. Uh, first question, did you receive the vaccine or the placebo? Second question, did you get symptoms or did you not get symptoms? And then you, develop, uh, you uh, fill out the two-way table from, from that. Okay, so that was the uh, extra step that I added in. Uh, so the next part is to make a vaccine, uh, sorry, make a vaccine, to make a Venn diagram summarizing the results. Got that V word stuck in my head. Uh, vaccine Venn diagram, same thing. No, not really. All right. Make a Venn diagram summarizing the results. So when we're making the Venn diagram, uh, what we want to do, if you recall from uh, our lecture, we want to choose one of the things, uh, one of the answers from the first variable. So in this case, let's just choose vaccine because that's just the first one there. And then one of the answers from the second variable. So let's just choose symptoms. And uh, if you recall, the total is not going to show up in the Venn diagram. So let's get a new page here. Fresh page here. So for our Venn diagram, we'll have one uh, circle representing one of those sets, another circle representing the other set, and we can fill in the information. So what we chose for the first one was vaccine. And what we chose for the second one was oops, symptoms. Okay, so uh, we look at the intersection of these two sets where these overlap. Those are individuals that were given the vaccine and developed symptoms. So we go back to our 2A table. Uh, there were 20 that were given the vaccine that developed symptoms. So that goes here where those two sets inter uh, intersect. Okay, uh, next, if we look at this portion, of, of the Venn diagram. Those are uh, individuals that were given the vaccine, but it is outside of the symptom circle. So those are individuals that got the vaccine that did not develop symptoms. So from our table, that is 80 individuals there. Okay, so what is what is this portion right here of the Venn diagram represent? These are individuals that got symptoms. Okay. Uh, but were they on the vaccine or, or the placebo? In this case, the placebo, since they weren't, since they aren't in the vaccine circle. And so that number Since we have, let's go back to what we had. So the symptoms that were given the placebo, placebo and symptoms, 40 individuals there. So that will be 40. And then uh, right here, outside of both circles, uh, are individuals that did not have the vaccine, so they were given the placebo. And outside of the symptom circle, so those that developed uh, that did not develop any symptoms. Those were 10 individuals there. So there is our Venn diagram. So notice all of the numbers here that appear are not going to be any of the totals. Uh, so the 100 is not going to appear in the diagram. The 50 is not going to appear. The 150 is not, 90 is not, the 60 is not. These numbers will. So the 20, 40, 80, and 10 
are the only numbers that should appear in the Venn diagram. Okay. And then the question that we were posed, let's write that here, how many uh, people who received the vaccine did not improve. Okay. Well, if you didn't improve, then did you develop symptoms or not develop symptoms? So that's the first thing we have to match it up with what, what we have either on our two-way table or the Venn diagram. Again, you can use either one. Um, here I'll use the Venn diagram since that's here, but you can use the table, that's fine. So did not improve, that means they developed symptoms. So they had symptoms. So we're asking how many people were on the vaccine, got symptoms in this, qu in this case, that is where these two intersect, which is 20. So there are 20 individuals. Okay. Uh, so that's question two. Um, any questions up to this point? And again, I'll keep my eye on chat. I'll answer any questions as I see them. Just as a reminder, uh, those aren't the, that, that isn't the only uh, type of question we could ask. There are several types of questions we can ask with this, with this uh, setup. Um, so if you want to see more of that again, uh, I would go through the review or the, uh, the review for test one or the notes uh, when we talked about this section. Okay, and I'm not seeing any questions. So we'll continue on. Okay, let's go back to the review here. So that was question two. Question three, so we're given a deductive argument, which is uh, this, this uh, that I have highlighted right now. So the argument is all Labradors love to swim, Rex loves to swim, uh, Rex is a Labrador. So we want to answer these questions. Um, discuss the truth of the premises. So are the premises true or false? Draw a Venn diagram that represents the relationships of the, of the sets and put an X where the Rex belongs in the diagram. So that's using our Venn diagram to analyze a deductive argument. And then the last part, state whether the argument is valid and, and sound. So remember that um, there are those two things that we have uh, when it comes to deductive arguments, an argument can be valid or not valid and can be sound or not sound. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into that here. So this one is question three. So for question three, we have a deductive argument And the first premise is all Labradors love to swim. Second premise, Rex loves to swim. Okay, and our conclusion that we are drawing from this is that Rex is a Labrador. Okay, so let's start with the truth of the premises. Premise one, is uh, this true or false? And premise two as well, same question, true or false? So 
So the first premise, all Labradors love to swim. In this case, let's go ahead and say that is true. To be honest, I don't know much about Labradors. Um, whoops, that is, okay. Um, I don't know much about Labradors, but we'll go ahead and take the, uh, the person making the argument at their word. And premise two, Rex loves to swim. Well, Rex is referring to, in this case, an animal, hopefully, or maybe not. <laughs> uh, Rex loves to swim. Again, we're going to assume that the person isn't lying to us, that that, that is true. So um, in this case, both are true. All right. So that's the first part, uh, discuss whether the premises are true. Second, draw a Venn diagram that represents the relationship. Okay. So for our Venn diagram, uh, for premise one, all Labradors love to swim. So in this case, that is the form all X are Y. In this case, all Labradors are things that love to swim. So from our, our lecture notes, we know that is a subset relationship. So we have a big set and a little set. All Labradors love to swim. So we have the Labradors are the subset and things that love to swim are the big set. So that is premise one. Premise two, Rex is a Labrador. Uh, sorry, that's the conclusion. Premise two, sorry. Rex loves to swim. So here, for premise two, Rex loves to swim, that is going to be inside of the loves to swim circle. But notice that it doesn't tell us whether Rex is a Labrador or not. Premise two doesn't say anything about Labradors, about Rex being a Labrador or not being a Labrador. So Rex could go either way in this case. Uh, so we'll put the X on the boundary between those two sets, because it could be either inside or outside of that circle. So that's our Venn diagram. Okay. And the last part, is the argument valid? Well, for that, we look at the conclusion. So if we take the conclusion by itself, Rex is a Labrador, what we expect, if this, if this is a, a valid argument, then the conclusion will, will match our Venn diagram. So we have Labrador and the X should strictly be inside of that circle. Does this match what we have? Well, in this case, not quite. Because the X is not, because the X is on the boundary, it could be either inside or outside of that circle. Uh, so this, in this case, it doesn't, it doesn't match. This is not valid. Okay. And then the last part, state whether the argument is valid and sound. So is this argument sound or not sound? Not sound, that is correct. Remember, for an argument to be sound, two conditions have to be met. Whoops. Sorry, let me adjust the window there so I can actually write that. Two conditions have to be met. First condition is that all the premises have to be true. In this case, that's, we went through that at the beginning. That's, that is, uh, that's, 
satisfied. The second condition is that it has to be valid. But in this case, this argument is not valid. So this argument cannot be sound. So, sorry, I thought I heard a question. No questions. Okay. So uh, just as a reminder, in order for the argument to be valid, no, sorry, to be sound, two conditions have to be met, has to be valid. In this case, that is not met. And second, all the premises have to be true. And that condition is met. The second condition, all the premises are true, but not the uh, validity part. It's not valid. Okay. Question four. We want to decide whether the following statement makes sense or does not make sense, so is true or false. We want to use our reasoning, and here we're using unit conversions and mathematics to do so. So here we, we're looking at our uh, units uh, that we had. Uh, so here, let's look at what we have. Uh, the recommended amount of water for an adult is 64 ounces per day. I like to buy in bulk, so for a week, I will need 24 liters. And we are given that there are 33.8 ounces in one liter. And so again, for these, when we have a, a question on units, what we need for a unit conversion will be given to us, um, whether that's converting between, uh, well, in this case, metric and the uh, US system, I believe. Okay, so let's go to our digital paper. And let me adjust that where it needs to be. Okay, uh, so this one is question four. So we have uh, recommended water is 64 ounces per day. And the statement is that uh, one liter per week is enough is enough water. Okay, so for this one, we're looking at our, our units. We have ounces per day. Here we have liters per week. We want these to be the same. So we either want to convert uh, both of the, of the uh, volume to ounces or liters and then uh, convert both of the uh, time units to either day or week. Uh, so let's 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 uh, let's convert this to ounces per week. Let's convert to ounces per week. Again, that doesn't have to be the only one. We have four choices here. We could do uh, ounces per day. We could do ounces per week. We could do liters per day or liters per week. Uh, any one of those that you decide to do is fine, as long as you show your work. Uh, but in this case, I'm just choosing the ounces per week. So for the first one, we have 64 ounces per one day. And our conversion to get this into a uh, week, we'll have our uh, day on top, the week on bottom, and there are seven days per one week. So the days cancel, and we use our calculator. Where did I put that? It's our non-programmable calculator, 64 times 7. And we get 448 ounces per week is how much is needed, or the recommended amount of water that is needed for an adult. Okay, 
that was the first thing. Second thing, then we have one liter for one week. I'm sorry, I need to move this up so it'll let me write for one week. And in this case, we want to convert the ounces to liters. So we have liters and we have ounces. And the conversion factor we were given in the problem is there are 33.8 ounces in one liter. So again, we want the liters to cancel. And I wrote this down wrong, didn't I? Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> well, if this, if this as I have it written before I correct myself, would one liter be enough for a week? Well, one liter for a week, that would be 33.8 ounces, ounces for the week. If we need 448, that's not enough. So one liter would not be enough. Let's go back here. I wrote down the wrong thing here. It says I will need 24 liters. So that should be 24. So I apologize for that. Let's go back to our paper here. So we can change that, that's 24. Oh, will 24 be enough? So we multiply 24 times the 33.8. And what we get is 811.2 ounces per week. So is that enough? If we need 448 and we have 811, then we do have enough. So this is a true statement. Okay. So that one is question four. Question five is in the same vein as, as uh, unit conversions. So let's go to our recipe here. So this is our recipe that is, that is being referenced here. We have grand, grandma's favorite cookie recipe is given. So here is the recipe. Uh, you only have nine eggs and want to make as many cookies as you can. So how many cookies can you make is the first question that we are asked. And along that, along those lines, uh, what is the necessary amount of baking soda that is needed? Okay, so again, we're using this recipe. Uh, the directions we don't need because this is just dealing with the uh, amount of ingredients. So, Notice uh, two things. First off, this recipe makes 24 servings. So this, this recipe makes 24 cookies and it calls for two eggs. That's what we're given with the recipe. And for problem five, we have nine eggs. So we only have nine eggs to work with. We wanna make as many cookies as possible. So let's go back to our digital paper here. This one is number five. So we have, uh, we need two eggs for, uh, what was the, uh, I believe that was 24 cookies? 24 cookies, yeah, 24 servings. And we have 
9a. So we want to know how many cookies can we get? How many cookies can we make with that? So notice we have um, we can make assuming that we have an unlimited supply of all of the other ingredients, which we're, we are going to assume then we can make uh, nine out of two batches of cookies, where one batch is following the formula, uh, the recipe once. Because each batch of cookies requires two eggs. And again, we're assuming that the other ingredients, we have enough. Uh, so we have nine half batches, or we can write that as a fraction, uh, 4.5 batches of this recipe. And each batch makes 24 cookies. So we can make either the 9 halves or the 4.5, 9 halves times the 24. is 108 cookies. So those are the, the number of cookies that we can make with those eggs, with nine eggs. Any questions on that first part? And again, you might you might be typing, so I'll keep my eye on chat. But I'll continue on. Uh, the next part is find the necessary amount of baking soda. So even though we have an unlimited amount of baking soda, we want to know how much baking soda will be will we be using. So we look down the recipe to where we have the baking soda, and it calls for one teaspoon of baking soda. Okay. So we have one batch. One batch requires one teaspoon of baking soda. And we need to make nine and a half or 4.5 batches. So we need four and a half teaspoons of baking soda for, the, for uh, making these four and a half batches. To make 108 cookies. Okay, so that's question five. And so again, if this if this appears on the final, this this will be provided. So you'll be you'll be given the uh, the recipe in question. In this case, it was the chocolate chip cookies. It could be any recipe, but that that uh, anything that you need will be provided on on the exam, unless it's something that you should have memorized that you've had memorized for previous exams. That was number five. Grandma's favorite recipe, okay. Number six, absolute and relative change. So we're looking for absolute change and relative change. So here we have out of uh, 10,000 teens, ages 16 to 18, surveyed in 2008, 555 used marijuana on a regular basis. And then in 2017, uh, 1,000 used the drug on a regular basis. So we want to find the absolute change and the relative change in those amounts. So let me get a fresh piece of paper here. This one is number six. So we have uh, 2008.
the number that we are given is 555. And then in 2017, the number that we have is 1,000. Okay, we wanna find the absolute change and relative change in those numbers. So first, we have the absolute change. This is going to be the uh, new value, 1,000 minus the old value, 555. And again, you can use your calculator if you need or your head. If you can do that in your head, that's fine. So we get for this one is 450, 445, sorry, 445. Now this could be positive or negative, it's positive. If the number increased, in this case it did, so we should have a positive, which we do. Or if it decreases, then we should have a negative. And then for the relative change, we have the uh, new value minus the old value divided by the old value and then we want this, uh, this is a percent, so to get it into percent form, we multiply by 100. So that's going to be 445 over 555 times 100. And let's round to two decimal places. So we'll have 80.18% so the amount, uh, the amount of individuals using marijuana increased by eighty percent, and again that will that will be the same sign as the absolute change. So positive if it's increasing, negative if it's decreasing. In this case, it increased, so it's a, a positive eighty point eighteen percent. Okay. And number seven, following table indicates a student's performance along with their corresponding weights. So this is a hypothetical class. We have these weights for those categories. Notice all of these except for the final is, is uh, 10%. So this is 10%, 10%, 10%. At the end, we have 20%. So the first thing we wanna do is compute the student's cumulative grade. And then we have a couple of questions after that. Assume the student has not yet taken the final and wants a C minus. Uh, what do they need to earn on the final to get that grade? Okay. So what we are doing for this problem, if you recall, we want to find uh, what we call the grade points that are uh, given to the student for each category. So we think of we think of the final grade as being 100 points instead of 100%. And uh, each, each category of the grade gives a certain number of points, uh, which is given by the uh, students. In this case, the homework average was a 97. So that, that is what is contributing to those points. And it's 10% of the grade. So we want 10% of 97 for those grade points. So we take 10% of 97. Let's go to our digital paper here. Okay, so for seven, we want uh, for the homework grade points, then we want 10% of 97. Well, so that's 0 0.1 times 97. We'll use our calculator. 0 0.1 times 97, we get 9.7. And we continue on. 
with each category, uh, and we find the, the grade points for each one. And so we continue. Uh, with all categories for the grade. So for each one of these, when we take the 10%, I'm going to um, give you what values you should get. So you should get uh, 8.4. Sorry, I need to move the page up. There we go, 8.4. For the mini project, you should get uh, 7.5. For test one, uh, 8.6. For test two, 2.5. For test three, uh, 9.6. For project one, 9.1. .1. For project two, 8.8. .8. For project three, and 12.4 for the final. Now here, you have to be careful, and I do want to emphasize this. Um, what, what the uh, grade points are depend on the weight of that category. Now these are 10%, but notice this one is 20%. You'd have to take 20% of 62. So that remember that's 0.2 times 62. And that gives us our 12.4. Then to find the uh, cumulative grade, so to find the, the final grade, what we do is we take the sum of all of the grade points. So we add all of these together. So we have the 9.7 plus the 8.4 plus 7.5 plus 8.6 plus 2.5 plus 9.6 plus 9.1 plus 8.8 plus 12.4. And in this case, what we get is 76.6%. So that is the student's final grade in this, uh, in this example. So let's go back to our review page here. Okay, so to find the cumulative grade or the final grade, you find the grade points for each category, you add those together, and that gives you the uh, cumulative grade. OK, so that's the first part, first question. Second part, second question. Assume the student has not yet taken the final exam and wants a 70% in the course. What do they need to earn on the final exam to earn that grade? So for the second part, Go back to our digital paper. If we want a 70%, then we're going to assume that the final is zero above here. And uh, what we get then the grade points earned up to that point, well, that's gonna be the 76.6 .6 minus the 12.4. We got 12.4 grade points from the final. And so that is 64.2. So before the final exam is calculated into the grade, the student has 64.2 grade points. Now, we want to know uh, what to get on the final exam to get a 70%. So if we go back, we look at what is the weight 
of the final exam. The weight for the final exam in this course, in this hypothetical course, is 20%. 20% of the grade is for the final exam. So let's go back to our digital paper. So we have the grade points earned. Grade points plus 20%. So that's going to be 0 0.2 of their score that they get for the final exam. So let's use the variable x for that. And we want that to be a 70. Well, in this case, we know that the grade points are 64.2. So we want to solve the equation. Sorry, let me rewrite that. 64.2 plus 0 0.2 times x equals 70. So we subtract the 64.2 over. We divide both sides by 0.2. And again, I'll leave the details for you guys. So what we get, what do we get for X, for the final exam score? So we do 70 minus the 64.2 divided by 0.2. We get X should be a 29. So as long as the student gets 29 or better, on the final exam in this hypothetical uh, scenario, the student will pass the course. Okay. And that is uh, time for today. So next class, we'll start with question eight. Uh, I think, well, let me, let me, so let me, uh, let me, state this. Let's go back to the review here. Um, what I would recommend doing, so we went through problem seven. Uh, what I would do is I would go uh, through the rest of this of this review, do problem eight, nine, ten, as many of these as you can. Um, I think we'll have enough time, but just in case we don't, when you're going through this, this review, if there is one of these questions that you want to see in greater detail, uh, like take, for example, 17, if you want a, um, a refresher on theoretical probability, you're not sure if we're going to get to that, that question, we might not finish all of the questions, then uh, let me know at the beginning of, of class on Thursday, and we'll go through those, those questions. Um, otherwise, if, if there's no question you want to see more than any other, we'll start with question eight. So that's, that's going to be our plan. Uh, any last minute questions before I let you guys go? Let me do that. Okay. All right. I'm not seeing any questions. I'm not hearing any questions. All right. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can you can feel free to email me. Of course, I will be answering emails. I also have uh, office hours today, digital office hours. Um, Otherwise, thank you for coming. Have a wonderful day. I will see you on Thursday.